Today, we will learn and reflect on the Stoic work in the Appendix of the Philokalia, titled, On the Character of Men in the Virtuous Life. Now, you may ask, how can we benefit when we ponder this Stoic work? Both the Stoic philosophers and the Eastern Church Fathers in the Philokalia show us how to live a godly life, to love God, and to love our neighbor as ourselves by living a life of daily discipline and prayer. We always like to quote from the works we are discussing. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources used for this video and my blog that covers this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments below. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. St. Nicodemus, when he compiled the Philokalia several centuries ago, placed the work on the character of men and the virtuous life. That's the first chapter in the original compilation of the Philokalia, as it was credited to St. Anthony, one of the first fathers of the desert. The editors of the modern compilation of the Philokalia relegated this work to the appendix, arguing that it was more Stoic than Christian noting that biblical references are entirely absent from this work. And as you note that we have many videos on the Stoic philosophers and we invite you to sample them to indeed judge for yourselves how close their teachings come to that of the early church fathers and the apostles and the, the gospels and the epistles. We are quite fortunate that the current editors respected Saint Nicodemus to keep his work in the modern Philokalia as it is indeed a treasure. The Philokalia does not strive for originality. This author, who was writing under the pseudonym of St. Anthony, indeed copied ideas and phrases from the Stoic philosophers. Likely he was a Stoic philosopher who converted to Christianity. Should we be critical of this influence of Stoic philosophy? What is better, the ancient Greek culture saturated in, in the unselfishness of Stoic philosophy, where self-discipline is the ideal? where we are bid to control our passions, or today's modern culture, saturated in selfish psychobabble, where we are bid to give full reign to our uncontrollable passions, lest we burst out in neurosis, where nothing is our fault, really, where all the faults are blamed on our family, on our environment, on our neurosis, where we blame our sufferings on anything but our own lack of self-discipline. Our Stoic philosopher in this Philokalia teaches us to control the passions, seeking God's help through grace. When a man reveres God with all his heart and with faith, he receives through God's providence the power to control anger and desire. For it is desire and anger which are the cause of all evils. We have received from God self-control, forbearance, restraint, fortitude, patience, and the like, which are great and holy powers, helping us to resist the enemy's attacks. And also, the four passions are self-esteem, levity, anger, and cowardice. And I might add that one of the characteristics that are common to the Eastern Church Fathers and the monastics and the Stoic philosophers is this fondness for lists of virtues and vices. We should search out our own faults and scrutinize our own way of life to see if they are pleasing to God. And our Stoic philosopher asks, What concern is it of ours if another man is wicked? The lack soul is turbid and perishes through wickedness, since it contains within itself profligacy, pride, insatiate desire, anger, impetuosity, frenzy, murderousness, carulousness, jealousy, greed, rapacity, self-pity, lying, sensual pleasure, sloth, dejection, cowardice, morbidity, hatred, censoriousness, or being judgmental, Debility, delusion, ignorance, deceit, and forgetfulness of God. Holiness, salvation, and a crown of incorruption are given to the man who bears misfortunes cheerfully and with thankfulness. To control anger, the tongue, the belly, and the sensual pleasures is of utmost benefit to the soul. The truly intelligent soul is not disturbed when she sees the success of the wicked and the prosperity of the worthless. What is our most precious possession? A virtuous way of life, confirming to God's will, surpasses all wealth. When you reflect on this and keep it in your mind constantly, you will not grumble, whine, or blame anyone. 
but will thank God for everything, seeing that those who rely on repute and riches are worse off than yourself. The more frugal a man's life, the happier he is, for he is not troubled by a host of cares. We should seek the prosperity that fills our soul rather than our pocket, for chasing after new cars and castle and country clubs will only add to the cares of this world. Should we pray to God to fill our pockets, or should we complain to God when our pockets are not filled, complaining how our prayers are never answered? Should our prayers really just be a shopping list we hand to God? The Stoics and the Eastern Church Fathers differ. Thieves can steal our wealth, but never our virtue. Here the Philokalia teaches that we should never consider it a loss when we lose our children, our money, or our possessions, but be thankful for all that God has loaned to us for use, knowing it could be taken away at any time. This is also a frequent teaching of Epictetus and the other Stoics, not to allow our misfortunes to turn us away from God and the love of God and the love of our neighbor. And this reminds us of a favorite saying I have from Epictetus, who was a Stoic philosopher. Epictetus tells us of someone who stole his lamp one night, but he got the better end of the exchange. For Epictetus only lost his lamp, but he kept his faith. But, on the other hand, the man who stole his lamp, in exchange for the lamp, he consented to become a thief, becoming faithless. The Stoic Epictetus, who is the freed slave of a freed slave, would certainly agree to this teaching of the Philokalia. Man is free if he is not a slave to sensual pleasures, but through good judgment and self-restraint masters the body with true gratitude and is satisfied with what God gives him, even though it is quite scanty. Do not seek wealth and riches, but instead seek virtue, seek the love of God. Men who are not happy with what they have but desire more enslave themselves to passions that disturb the soul, crying out, more, 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 more. The desire for more than one needs does not allow one's soul to struggle or to be saved. Whether you are a slave to your passions, or whether you are free and do not yield to your passions, this is your choice. For God created you with free will, and he who overcomes the passions of the flesh is crowned with incorruption. All who come into this life, both those who live modestly and those who enjoy wealth and ostentation, leave this life as if it were an inn. Each takes with him none of its pleasures and riches, but only his past actions, whether they are good or whether they are bad. To escape death is impossible. Knowing this, those who are truly intelligent and practiced in virtue and spiritual thought accept death without complaining, without fear or grief, for death is inevitable and delivers us from the evils of this life. We see tension between contentment and justice. We should not become angry with those who sin, even if what they do is criminal and deserves punishment. Rather, for the sake of justice, they ought to be corrected or even punished. But we should not become angry or excited, for anger brings passion. Anger impedes good judgment and justice. Moreover, we should not approve of those who show more mercy than is proper. The wicked must be punished for the sake of what is good or just, but not as a result of our personal passion or anger. Both the Stoics and the Church Fathers teach us that we should control our passions. Intelligent people must ceaselessly remember that by enduring slight and passing suffering in this life, we gain the greatest joy and eternal bliss after death. Therefore, if a man falls when struggling against the passions and wishing to be crowned by God, he should not lose heart and remain fallen, despairing of himself, but he should rise and begin again the struggle to win his crown. Until his last breath, he should rise whenever he has fallen. For bodily toil is a weapon used by the virtues and brings salvation to the soul. So in essence, the Stoicism and the Christian life rewards persistence in pursuing good. The Christian life centers on the love of God and the love for our neighbor. Concentration on the holiness of living together with attentiveness to the soul leads to goodness and the love of God. For he who seeks God finds him by overcoming all desires through persistence in prayer. Such a man does not fear demons. Those who are truly men must endeavor to live with the holiness and love of God so that their holy life shines before others. The man who is good and enjoys the love of God and who truly knows him never ceases to do ungrudgingly all that accords with his will. Such men are rare. 
Our intellect is what separates man from the beasts, reason from passion. Intelligence is what enables man to worship God and lead a selfless life. Our Stoic philosopher tells us, nothing is more precious to man than intelligence. Its power enables us to adore God through intelligent speech and thanksgiving. By contrast, when we use futile or slanderous speech, we condemn our soul. An obtuse man blames his sins on the conditions of his birth or on something else, while his words and actions are evil through his own free choice. Intellect that does not lead us to the love of God is a gift from God that is wasted. Our soul philosopher tells us, an intellect that enjoys the love of God is a light that shines on the soul, just as the sun shines on the body. And there is no profit in studying doctrines unless the life of one's soul is acceptable and conforms to God's will. The cause of all evil is delusion, self-deception, and ignorance of God. Just as the body is dead without the soul, so the soul without the intellect is inert and cannot receive God. And this runs counter to the modern notion that salvation is achieved when we emotionally let Jesus in our heart and do nothing else. Living a godly life takes effort, takes study, takes learning. And we must learn to use our intellect to study scriptures and the church fathers to learn and internalize the good in our hearts. The intelligent soul endeavors to free itself from error, delusion, boastfulness, deceit, from jealousy, rapacity, and the like, which are the work of demons and of man's evil intent. Everything is successfully achieved through persistent study and practice when one's desire is not impelled towards base pleasures. The soul is divinized through the intellect, but the nature of the body makes the soul grow slack. Jesus warns us not to cast pearls before swine, as our Stoic philosopher tells us. Do not try to teach people at large about devoutness and right living. I say this not because I begrudge them such teaching, but because you will appear ridiculous to the stupid. Here the Philokalia teaches that we should not argue with our neighbor over truth, over religious doctrine, and if somebody wants to argue with us, we should refuse, lest our brutish tongue kills and petrifies our intellect. As bad water ruins good wine, so harmful talk corrupts those who are virtuous in life and character. Instead, when we gather together with other Christians, we should heed the exhortation in Hebrews to always encourage one another. May we discuss our faith with patience and love. As our soul philosopher tells us, the intellect responsive to God's love is an invisible blessing giving to God, but to those whose life by its virtue commends itself to Him. God grants man intellect, understanding, spiritual knowledge, and the power to discern what is good, so that realizing the harm that comes from evil, they may avoid it. And we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. We have volume one of the Philokalia, which we find easy to read. And also we have another volume uh, on the Philokalia. It contains a lot of essays about the Philokalia and the works in the Philokalia, although it does not cover this particular work. Also, we have a picture of the church whose icons we used in this video. And we want to emphasize that one of my hobbies is taking pictures of icons and stained glass windows of churches. And we have a picture from Mount Athos of the monastery in our thumbnail. Please click on the link for our blog and this topic in the description below, and please click on the links for interesting videos and other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.